Hey everybody, welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. My name is Colin Way and we're joined on the cameras by Ben Beddows over there. Um, sorry, we're li- just a little bit late. We were trying a few new things for you, some some new hardware and stuff that never quite worked. So uh, we're back to the old gear, but hopefully things should be all good for you. Um, today is um, a nice, simple project. Um, it's sort of halfway between um, a, a a cutting board really and a little platter we're going to do like a cheese board so it's a slightly raised lip cheese board ever so simple so those of you that are just starting your turning um you're going to get hopefully a fair bit out of this one it's going to be fairly basic bowl gouge techniques a little bit of skew work just a scraping and some a little bit of parting tool going on we're going to use a food safe finishing oil in this um we've got a lovely piece of timber in the shape of elm um a little bit of burry elm as well so we'll show you that in a moment and uh, and actually what we're going to be making if i can show you very briefly is this lovely board here okay so it's a really 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 not really 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 a lovely bit of elm Okay, and you can see there are holding on the back. So probably the easiest, well, one of the easiest projects we've had in a long time. Everything can be made um, harder or easier, though, depending on the lathe you have, the kit you have, and the ability that you've got. Um, So, you know, don't look at this as your master template. Look at this as just an idea, and you can run with it. You You might want to, for instance, put feet on this one turn it into a tripod um, uh, base if you want to. Um, Timber does move and warp around, so sometimes I understand that it can be a little bit annoying if it starts to get a bow on it and starts to wobble on the the bench when you're trying to cut your cheese or your bread or whatever you want to use it for. And I say it's a sort of a cross between a platter or a plate as well. You can see the raised lip just to keep the crumbs on um, the piece of the board that it should be. So I wouldn't class this as a breadboard or anything like this because it's not flat. You couldn't get your knife flat to the the surface however for cheese and things like that then then ideal lovely bit of timber like i say and a very very basic shape okay so i just like to comment on a we went to or i went to cardiff on the weekend if you're in the UK, you understand what it was like on Friday, how um, how wet and windy it was. Um, but it cooled down or it would calm down enough on Saturday for me to t- pay a visit to Cardiff to give a bit of a robust uh, presentation demonstration um, and was g- uh, greeted by um, a bank full of full chairs and um, lots of smiling faces. So I want just to, to say thank you for everybody that turned up in Cardiff, made the journey. And especially there's a few people that I've met and I'm really awful with names I've completely forgotten. So I'm I'm asking if those people would like to just drop us a line or, or an email. Um, one particular chap, and I'm not going to show you his picture yet until I've got his name because I've forgotten it. Um, it's a magician turned up. And he's uh, into making wands, um, at, amongst other things. He's um, a terrific maker because I've seen some pictures. Um, we were having a long chat. We had a photo taken. I've forgotten your name. And until I know your name again, I'm not going to put your picture up because um, I want to introduce you properly. And we did talk maybe about a guest spot on the Woodworking Wisdom as well, looking at making some of these these wands. So maybe one for the future. So if you could just drop us a line uh, and let me know or remind Ben, then that'd be great also i didn't have enough time to talk to and i really wanted to there's a couple that turned up from swindon you know who you are um uh, we we had a very brief chat but i just wanted to talk to you a little bit uh a little bit more just to say how grateful i was that you turned up and uh, to expand on our conversation so again if you can either let ben know on the chat or drop me a line uh at woodworking wisdom i really like to carry on our conversation and and talk to you a bit more and just find out how your weekend went really because you made the journey stayed in a hotel just to come and watch me do a little bit of turning so really really appreciate that Anyway, enough of that. Let's get on with the project. So the project today is this lovely cheese board. And I say lovely. We haven't made it yet, but I'm hoping it's going to be lovely. I've got a pretty pretty, uh, big suspicion it will be purely by the timber that we're using. Um, This is a piece of elm. It's a very uh, nice color um, for elm. It's it's got that really dark colors, a nice swirly grain, lots of burrs, lots of character to it. So burrs, knots, all of those sorts of things. Um, But this is a cheese board. I don't want those knots um to be unhygienic and grab bits of food and 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 retain in there so what i'm going to do is have this as the back 
and the less knotty and fractured surface is the front. So we still got that beauty of the timber in there, um, but it won't be on the front surface where it can grab the food. Okay, so all I've done, I've uh, mounted this on a face. I've done this before um, you turned up, only because I wanted to make sure it was a decent grip on the face. On the, um, sorry, it's a screw chuck we're using here, so it's a single, um, a single screw. Um, I didn't want to use um, a faceplate because I couldn't get screws short enough. And remember, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna try and retain as much as this as possible. So I've used a single screw hole um, around about 10 mil deep. So I'm gonna go in it a little bit from. We're going to waste a little bit of the timber on the front. I'm also going to go in a little bit to create the lip on the front as well. Um, so single fixing. Now, bear this in mind. If you're just beginning, if you're unsure about using some of these tools, the potential for you getting a catch or grab on your project is greater. So if you're using a screw chuck, that's only one single fixing. If you're going to do that, use the tail stock. I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment. Um, otherwise, if you're at all unsure and you can't use the the tail stock then use a faceplate you've got more fixings far more secure and so on but this is a great method if you only want that one screw hole if you're making a candlestick for instance that has a single hole in the middle and that shape's gonna um, be ruined by a set of screw holes that would be the time where we use a, um, a, a screw chuck but look what i'm going to do is bring these um the tail stock up just support it while i rough down as much of this as possible so the this face and the outside edge so just a little bit of support from the tail stock just to give me that extra bit of um a security and safety for myself um, and we're going to start off by just roughing the surface once i've roughed the surface and got roughly where i want to be then i can remove the tail stock to do the last few cuts for the what will be the recess uh in the center to hold so let's start by doing that i've got the speed controller there and as usual you've heard me say this many times uh, lay speed to zero turn the lathe on i've checked to make sure nothing's touching the tool rest and that everything is nice and secure um, and then we can start just roughing down to start with so i'm roughing it down there at a thousand revs so we go straight to our bowl gouge in fact let's go to a, a big-ish bowl gouge this is a, a 12 mil or half inch bowl gouge here and i'm just going to drag cut initially So just taking a light cut, just skimming the surface. Every pass you make, it'll become flatter and flatter. And what we'll do, we'll rough this down, make sure we got our surface nice. Then I'll do a, a slight push cut and we'll give it a little bit of scrape from the skew. There we are. And don't forget, as normal, everybody, if you've got questions to ask, just use that chat function, ask Ben, and he'll transfer those questions to me. Yes, Ben, we got a first. Um, so we've got a question here. Um, where are we? So um, a question from Chris. Did you mention the diameter? I didn't. I've got two. In fact, I've got two different diameters here at the moment. So um, where have I put my rule? Let me just grab my rule a minute. Oh, it's in uh, on my desk. Yeah, lovely. So, yeah, no, we've got two different. This one's around about 12 inches here. So around about that 300 mil. Uh, this one's here a little bit smaller at 10. I'll measure them accurately for you. Um, it's a little bit like breadboards, chopping boards, that sort of thing. It's entirely, thank you, Ben. It's entirely um, up to you, really. If it's for yourself, then measure it to what your needs are. Um, if you're selling them, make a mixture, make a mixture of sizes. So, yeah, this smaller one is 260 mils. So it's, it's just over the 10 inches. And this larger one, so this one's just under the 12 inches. So just under 300 mils, about 295 okay but yeah no that's what i mean chris it's you know it's really entirely up to you what size you go for and a lot of the time what timber we can get hold of and um, that's the other thing um i don't know whether there is any specific size for bread for cheese boards same with bread boards that what i'm doing here i'm just going to give a little push cut we're going to go slightly dish toward the center
You don't have to do this, of course. You can go straight into a scraper. I'll show you what a scraper looks like in a mo. There we are, right to centre. Now, not all timber is going to like being pushed with a cut. This one in particular, look what's happening. I don't know whether the camera can make this out, but we're getting a bit of breakout, a bit of tear out here. So what you could do, how would you overcome that? You've got a, a couple of things you can do. You can do a pull cut with the, the bowl gouge, but using the flute directly facing into the timber with your handle low, and that'll produce, it's a practice cut. So just do that, practice it often um, with a sharp chisel. Is creating almost like a skew cut um, to the bowl. Um, and it looks like this. So handle down low and just very gently drag towards you. You get shavings, which are referred to as angel hair shavings because they're so light and wispy. The only thing here is there's no bevel rubbing. So your flat surface, you have to guide rather than rely on the bevel. But that works really, really well, um, and that will minimize any of that tear out and take it right the way down. The other thing you could try is a nice, fine scrape. And when I say a fine scrape, that means non-aggressive. So you're not pushing too hard. You're making sure your scrape is really, really sharp. This is a skew, and the difference with a nice scrape as opposed to a, um, an aggressive shape is you get these little, again, little wisps that come off almost like you're using a cabinet scraper you'll get that sort of that sort of finish which is quite nice and especially useful on this side grain which can be quite woolly so let's have a look this is doing quite well i'm not going to go any further we're just going to go straight into um a sanding in a moment now this like i said this has got a lot of features with it the, the features are very personal things to people. Some hate them, some, some love them. Um, some like features, um, some like some type of features, some won't. So burrs, for instance, most people, most turners, really, really love burrs and things like that. Others may not like dead branches or dead knots. This one um, has a bark inclusion that's come out. I'm going to leave it all. We're going to leave it all in, so we're going to make this a real feature board. That's fine for that face for the moment. We still need to do the recess, but I'm going to go to the outside edge and clean that up before we go any further. And the front face, before we then take the tail sock away and just make my recess. Yes, Ben. Okay, so Dan's got a question. He's saying, hello, um, excluding the lathe mounted lamp, what do you use in your home workshop for lighting? He says he's got an apex roof uh, workshop and is struggling to find decent lighting. So well, uh, certainly mine at home is LED um, strip lights. Um, I had those fitted back last summer. So LED strip lights and these, and Dan, that does make a massive difference, the, the level of brightness you can get. Most LEDs, you'll get three settings. Same as on mine, you've got the orange light, you've got the white light, and then you've got the natural light. Um, so on mine set to the brightest. That can cause a few issues sometimes if you're streaming to video you have to control your lighting a little bit more the good thing with these and i don't have these on purposely because they're a little bit too bright for camera you can see and uh, you can turn these up and down so these are well these are currently my favorite work light because it's that right type of light it's the bright light the white light um as opposed to the orange orange light but a little bit too bright for what we're doing here at the moment but that that's the best thing um i've just taken a recent uh, trip to the opticians yesterday as ben will vouch for and uh without nice bright light like this i'm gonna have to be wearing my glasses all the time and turning uh, which i don't enjoy so it's really important when we're working um especially if you're at the lathe for a long time um to have a decent a decent light but let's get rid of that one. So that's the only thing. Um, I use uh, actual LED strips. I know Jason's got LED uh, banks, so like square um, tiles. Um, that works. It's, it's, that, it's a different type of light than the normal yellow light that you get. Okay, but making sure nothing's touching the tool rest. Play speed the same as it was. We go down to a smaller gouge.
And we are now. We've hit a bit of stone because my gouge has immediately gone blunt. So it's uh, yeah, it's right here. So there's a bit of silica in there. We have a, like a little silica vein running through. You can tell what's happened the minute I hit that. You can there's a little ridge that's popped up here, and that gouge was really struggling to push forward. So unfortunately, that gouge has pretty much had it. So give me two seconds. Let me just try and use another part of the gouge to straighten up that cut. That's that one. I'm going to go and grab another gouge. It's the, um, the luxury of having a workshop with lots of lovely tools in it. I can go and grab another sharp chisel. There we are. Lay speed off, oh, sorry, lathe off. And we're going to take the tail stock away. Um, I'll take it right the way off on this one because we won't need the tail stock for this project anymore. Um, and before I do anything, just check to make sure we got good security. And that's on there nicely. I'm going to mark where the divide is, the recess I need. So we're good. I'm now going to turn the lay speed down to zero just before I start, even though we know it's nice and secure. And we're going to use a set of dividers. And I'm going to mark or measure what will be the in, the external part of my jaw. And we're using the C's in this case. So I'm using the speed sizes just to find the diameter of the C's externally. That can be then transferred over to the bowl or the platter or plate or cutting board and parting tool we'll cut the inside that's a little bit fast not that fast a little bit faster thousand revs cut the inside line i'm only going three to four mil would be absolutely fine in there and then we're just going to cut away the waste in the inside of course you can decorate the inside of that recess if you want to, just to let people see that you, you've taken care of every bit of it. Especially those other turners that like just to look at the bottom of your pieces. There we are. A little bit of a bevel rub going on now. And then we go back to our skew. So we want a little dovetail um, surface on the inside of the recess. And then a, just a gentle scrape. And that should be the recess done. Yeah, we're ready to start sanding now. And we'll oil the back side before we turn it over as well. We want to make sure this side is finished. So I'll take some questions while I'm setting up the dust extractor and getting our abrasive yes ben so a question here from ted um does colwyn ever use the double-ended chisels with the collet handle i do actually at home i do yes uh, have i got any here i've got a couple here yep so we've got the this is what we're talking about okay double-handed um i use these especially for demonstrating because it means that i don't have to run to the sharpening system that often we've got a couple of angles uh an angle Per side, so say we might have a 55 and a 40 or a 60 and a, and a, 40, a 55, for instance. So you can have them on both both carriages. That's a little 3.8 double-sided one. They're quite nice, okay, especially for traveling around and demonstrating. Yes, Ben? Um, where are we here? Um, so this is from 999. Um, not necessarily for today, but in a future demo... Could you possibly take us through all the wood turning tools on the wall behind you? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, we day to day we we use most of them. Um, I know it can be quite frightening, especially if you just started out in wood turning. You see this big bank of chisels, or if you go into a store, a well stocked store, and see all those chisels. A lot of the time, you can break it down fairly quickly, though. Um, so, for instance, behind me here, I've got. Um, the carbide tools right at the back and, and um, the little decorating elf. Then I've got the skew, my skews, Conway skews. Then I've got a set. Now, this is just a representation of different types of set. So I've got a nice hobby set here 
the Axminster Wood Turning Starter Set, and then we've got the um, the M42 Crown Set. So you would never have both of them, really. You'd probably only have one set if you're going to buy a set. Um, so there's that. We've got a couple of Jason Breach box refining tools here as well, um, and then my bank of gouges. So three sizes of gouges. You, because of the projects we're doing, we've got a quarter, a three eight, and a half inch. Okay, there. And then the basic sit, um, set again. So like these sets, this is our basic set. Uh, beading and parting tools, parting tools, skew chisels, uh, and scraper and a skew. So it's just a representation, really, because of what, you know, the previous question was asking about double-ended tools. It's nice to have them back here. Um, if you've seen any of my videos in my own workshop, it's a row of, of chisels again. Different sizes of gouges. I've probably got eight or nine gouges, the same in skews because of of what we do because what we demonstrate if you're not demonstrating if you're not streaming you won't need that many you probably need only about 10 ch uh, chisels um and that will get you most of your projects so you know don't worry too much but specifics yep we're going to be going through things like skew chisel use but obviously the bowls and um, bowl gouges that'll be used a lot and a few scrapers and things but uh yeah that's pretty much what we've got on the back there but yeah any specifics just shout them out and we can use them yes ben so I've got a question here from Frederick, but I think it's leading on from something that Maria said um, about, uh, where are we here? Um, the LED tubes um, that have replaced the fluorescence um, have a funny effect on two-tone timber. Um, and then the question from Frederick, um, have you ever heard of some woods fluorescing? Um, he's read that LED lamps emphasize that. If I'm honest, no, no, I've heard of, um, uh, like the halogen, the, the halogen causing, um, causing issues with stroke, that strobing effect, you know, is making it look as though your piece is standing still. So you get specific ones for workshop use, which have a different frequency, but I've experienced nothing but goodness from the LEDs. Um, if I'm honest, uh, it's really helped me visually see what i'm doing um but and it gives a, a, a slight it gives the natural tone of the timber as well you don't get that yellowing effect so i find it's better a long way yeah and, and, james, they, and they last a lot longer as well yes james is saying hi colwyn um he's just had to go at spirit staining u vase which was still a bit green um should he wait until it's totally dry till it totally dries out before sealing it or can you seal it now well what's going to happen james is it's going to dry and it's going to potentially crack so you've got to be really careful with the end grain um they generally move um if they're quite solid still so just yeah if you i what i would do is seal the end grain leave it for a while don't finish it and then bring it back maybe um, put it back on the lathe just to true it once it's completely dry as long as it stayed whole but yeah for the minute um, shove it full of um, uh, dilute thinner, uh, dilute sealer, so it can soak in a long way, and that help with its drying um, or stopping it from cracking too much. Okay, and some more great suggestions from Fuller. Keep them coming, Fuller. Um, some uh, about putting a whiteboard behind the lathe if it's close to the wall and that bounces light. Um, so great to hear those. Always helpful tips from Fuller. Um, the uh, so a question here from Mark. Could you make a signature skew with 200 mil more still and 200 mil less handle? So I'm guessing that's a full steel. Yes. Um, I'll bring in my my German skew, which is where we got the idea for these. The traditional German skew was all steel and your hand width of handle because the handle was there as a counterbalance not to hold on so you should be f um, holding the steel so you can feel the bevel rubbing um so that was the idea behind an authentic german skew chisel um it's just that we felt that the the uk wasn't ready to be frightened into it because the skew chisel was quite an intimidating tool already not that it should be it's um and we didn't want to just um you know present a chisel like that to people for for them to worry even more so now you're dead right though you look at the authentic german skews russian um uh, lathe knives and things like that they, they're going to have hardly any handle right i'm going to turn the dust extraction on are we okay ben for the minute <laughs> And we're going to do a mixture of sanding with hand and sanding with rotary sander. So 100 grit to start me off. Dust extractor is doing its job.
and I'm not going to sand as much as I should do. You don't want me to, to uh, well, you don't want to sit there watching me sand for hours. So we'll do our best. So a little bit of going over with the course first, just to do the groundwork. Bit of a power sander here would be good. Let's get the rotary sander out. We'll just check that surface. See where we're going with it. I want to get rid of all the nasties. Beautiful timber. Really, really pretty stuff. So let's start with a fairly coarse one. Just to speed it along a little bit, I've got 100 grit on there. that'll do us got 180 but we've also got the 150 hand sanding as well so we go straight into that we're going to oil this one we're going to use a, um, a food safe oil there we go I will stop the lathe one more time before we go to the finer grades. All right, let's have a quick look, see what we're doing. A little bit of tearing here still, but we're gonna we're gonna ignore it for the minute. I'll put it back on when you guys have gone and resand, but for the minute. I think that's all that we're going to do with this one. Let's go to a 180. I'll come to you in a minute, Ben. I'll just, uh, I'll do this and we can get the dust extraction off. And that was 180, so 240. And then finally on to a 400 grit. Okay. So we have, I'm hoping you can see that uh, you may, yeah, you can see these little tears here. I'm going to pretend they're not there. We're going to oil on top of this. And then when you guys have, have gone, I'll make sure I go put this back on, hold this, um, this rim and re-sand that area. But you want to keep sanding. And I would certainly, to get rid of that, keep sanding with 100 grip. So rotary sanding, power sanding, hand sanding, that sort of stuff. When they've then gone, then you can go through your grades, okay? But like I said, I don't want you to be sat there watching me sand for the next half hour. Ben, yes, questions? Okay, so we've got a uh, first question from, sorry, uh, question from Martin. Um, with the exception of, uh, of your skew, Colwyn, um, he's been uh, he's only been using carbide carbide tools for about a year. Um, if he buys a set of traditional tools, how hard do you think it would uh, would the transition be? Well, I think 
the transition, I think you probably have to go back to square one with like traditional tools. And I don't think you'd have any, um, have a harder time than anyone else picking them up for the first time. Do you know what I mean? But certainly the carbide tools, apart from scraping, won't be anywhere near, um, you know, presentation angles that you'd get when you're using things like bowl gouges, skew chisels, those sorts of things. Sounds like you've already had a go with the skew though. Um, well, I know you've had a go with the skew. Um, and the bowl gouge will be the biggie. That's to be the, the one to get mastered next. And I would encourage you. Now, I'm not going to put down carbide tools in any way because carbide tools are massive. Plus, they've um, introduced turning to lots of people. Um, well, my preference is traditional ones only because of the, the cutting action that you can get. And I just feel that you get a better finish before sanding and things like that. Um, but no, I don't think you're going to be in a worse place. But, uh, you know, you'll have some experience, like I say, you have with the skew, but your bowl gouges, if you can con concentrate on getting a bowl gouge working nicely, maybe then leading on to a spindle gouge, that sort of thing, I don't think you'll have a, have a problem. Yep. The, the big difference, of course, between carbide and, and traditional tools is the bevel. You've got bevel rubbing on traditional tools. Yes, Ben. So we've got a silly, um, a silly cheesy question here from Maria. <laughs> um, so... Uh, which cheeses would you recommend for this platter, and what's the best way to finish them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what cheese? Well, a nice, strong Stilton, and uh, down in one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you asked a silly question. <laughs> um, so this is from Paul. Um, can, could you use uh, chestnut finishing oil over their spirit stains on the ash timber? Uh, uh finish on over spirit stains yes um you, you, i finishing oil over stains you could do you could do um the trouble with it you wouldn't be able to work that oil in you would get residue you would get the the stain um the stain coming off when you do this sort of thing. So I'm sanding this oil in. Um, and really, oil needs a little bit of work once you put it on. If you just leave oil, the grain and the nap rises. Um, you do need to work it in a little bit. And I just fear that you may get some dragging with the with the, um, with the the stain. Not so much from the oil, but because you're lifting it off and then, um, then just the natural action of that abrasive or burnishing or rubbing of any sort will 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 drag the stain a little bit. I don't think it would really work. I mean, just to double check, it might be worth just asking Terry at Chestnut, um, give them a, a, a shout, an email, just to confirm that. But I don't think it would work. Mm -hmm. I use um, uh, finishing oil over my pyro quite a lot, and that's got um, stains on. But like you say, don't overwork it once it's on that surface. No. Um, and then, um, so a question here from Charles. Um, he's acquired some Axminster jaws for the um, 114 and the 100. Um, what's the best way to identify what jaw they are so that he can use the speed sizer? So, okay, so they should, um, depending on the age, of course, they should have on one of the jaws the actual name. So if I can get this on camera for you. Um, so the latest ones here. I don't know if I can get this to work. There we are. Expanding pin jaw. Okay. So that uh, so that particular one's on number one. So um, most of the jaws I know of, unless you're going back a fair while, will have a description on them. Otherwise, go to the website and um, just get the jaw page up. And there's a little diagram, one of the last photos on each jaw, which gives you the dimensions and it gives you the profile as well. All right. Um, and Frederick's just asking, how's Jason? Oh, Jay, absolutely fine. Jason's back. Jason will be on your uh, screens tomorrow. So he's all back fighting fit. I'll let you fill, I'll let him fill you in tomorrow. Are we okay for more questions, Colwyn? Keep going. Yeah. So uh, one here from Fuller. Um, what's for the chuck recess? How close to the perfect dovetail does one need to cut? Um, I, I'm never, 
I'm going to get shot down in flames now, but I never worry too much. As long as I've got it tapering back a little bit, I'm done. I'm happy. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, couldn't tell you how close I am. Probably nowhere near a real dovetail, but as long as it's tapering back a little bit for me, absolutely fine. And then um, from Lawrence, he's asking whether we, he can put photos of the projects on uh, Woodworking Wisdom. Um, that email, should I just? Yeah, so yeah. it's um, it's woodworkingwisdom at axminstertools.com. So any um, photos, we would really love to see those of, of you guys' work. Um, James is asking, was that a dry blank? <laughs> uh, it, was it a dry blank or is it double glossed the tanned? <laughs> Sorry. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Very much a dry blank. Um, how uh, thick was the blank? I just want to show you the, the colour. Sorry, Ben. All right. What a lovely, a lovely board that's going to be. The oil hasn't dried yet. You'll have to burnish it over 24 hour period. Um, but like I said, I do want to come back and resand that. Mind you, not that I can see any of the nasties at the moment, but we'll take special effort on the front. But what a wonderful bit of timber that is. All right. There we are. Yes, more questions, Ben. Um, Jim B, is there are there any woods to avoid on a project like this? Um, I, well, yeah, the traditional timbers for this elm is is used all the time in kitchenware, beech, sycamore, maple, um, those sorts of things. You, uh, ash salad bowls, fruit bowls, that sort of stuff as well. Oh. Just be careful with ash; it's not great for a chopping board because it tends to split quite easily. But then you can go into things like oak as well. Um, oak and el elm traditionally for chopping balls and grain. Um, timbers to avoid, um, certainly when you're using wet foods, are the, the obvious toxic or high allergen um, timbers, so things like yew, uh, laburnum, some of the softwoods which don't work very well in kitchenware and have a, um, a high degree of uh, sap in them. Um, one of Ben's favourite, which, uh, which often causes him problems, is cedar. Um, but yeah, so it's not just the toxicity, um, it's your, um, your allergic reactions to some of these symptoms as well. We spoke about that a couple of weeks ago, I think. But uh, so yeah, you got to just take those th sort of things into account. Um, Dan has some seasoned xylia. Yeah. Um, to turn, which, uh, which you've never used before. Is there anything special to know in terms of turning or finishing that wood? Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's quite um, a heavy glued sap substance um near the the cadmium layer so just under the bark so that's the only thing to to consider but no apart from that a beautiful timber um you should be absolutely fine no, no nothing that i can think of no and Paul's asking, what would you use over the spirit stains, lacquer or waxes? Spirit um, stain, I'd probably go um, a lacquer, a spray on lacquer, because you don't disturb the surface. So once you've got your colour right, spray over the top and it's left. Like I say, just no, no disturbance then. Um, and then uh, a question from Vida. Um, he says it might be a strange question, but what does food safe oil really do? Does it make the wood itself food safe or is there any other preventatives in the oil itself? No. So all a food safe oil, it's like a mineral oil. It's an inert um, uh, substance. So it, it's not, it's a non-toxic oil. Um, the difference between that and a toy safe oil, um, toy safe oil has a drying agent in it. And basically it'd be toy safe once dry. So once those dries have evaporated out, then it's safe to be mouthed. Um, where a uh, food safe oil um, is um, uh, non-toxic in its wet form. Okay, that's the difference. And Chris is saying they have some Iroko blanks. Um, any good for this project? He hates turning it, by the way, because of the dust when sanding. Yeah, the dust can be very um, peppery, very um, uh, painful to the nose and things like that. From um, I've seen it used in kitchenware before, and my assumption is that it's okay to use. Check it first, so. Um, just to you know to make sure but i don't think there's any issues with our oco um, as a solid timber um, just the dust can be a little bit um, uh, of an irritant you know okay laser speed to zero turn the lathe on we're going to skim the surface i may have to go back and get another gouge if we've got some um, issues with the timber so we're going to come down in diet in uh, thickness a little bit
checkpoint and never answered the question. Somebody was asking then, sorry, uh, what the thickness of the timber before we started. So it was around about 40 mil. It's not going to be 40 mil once finished. And the other one, the smaller one, the little 10 inch here, that is a finished size of 28 mil. All right, so I'm going to make this. That's actually really nice. I'm not going to come down much much further. So let's just clean that edge up. We clean that edge up. What happened there, apart from me being scared, senseless, was um, my tool rest just moved as I went into the edge. check to make sure i haven't knocked a big lump out of that what i don't want here is a sharp edge either so we will make sure that's blended over right then let's start taking some of that waste away We're going to have this nice and flat on after the internal lip. But I want to just see how far this hole goes down. I have measured this. And it's going in around about 10 mil. But I want to uncover that hole now before I make the lip. And the only reason I'm doing that, I might go and make the lip at the beginning and then take all the flat away and then decide, actually, that lip's now too big. It's too proud. So I want to take this away first. Bearing in mind, there is a little bit of a, a point on the drill bit, the actual lip bit. All right, let's see if we're down at the bottom of that hole. It looks good. So now we can start thinking about the lip. I think we're almost there. Okay, and I'm going to use a rule. Now, the rule won't be able to span the actual surface, but what you will be able to do, if you do that and look down the rule, and you can get a piece of, use a piece of tape, um, a timber if you want to, but I can look down that rule and I can just eyeball the difference in thickness in the gap just to see if I'm roughly there. And let's face it, it doesn't have to be flat, flat, but it wants to be almost there sort of thing. We're looking good. We're looking really good. I'm happy with that. The thickness is nice. It's got a good chunky surface. Um, it's fairly flat at the moment, so we're just going to clean up all areas. And I'm going to get the skew in this one just to give a little scrape. That's looking nice. Yeah, good with that. So what we'll do now, we'll just scrape that gently. It's not too badly torn up, so it's not going to give us too much of a headache. We'll go back with that little skew to the outside edge first. Have a 
look and see what we're left with. And, you know, we're just bowing a little bit there. So I want to flatten that a wee bit more. Just skimming the surface. Really, I'm just taking little high spots away. Let's stop. We'll have a look. And we're ready to go. So back with our abrasive, we're going to go onto the hundred. I'm going to just slightly radius this edge here. Really pretty timber that one. Yes, before I put the extractor on. Yes, Ben. So we've got a bunch of questions coming, Cohen. All right, I'll take um, the glasses off. First one um, is from, from Ted. Um, is Zebrano suitable for this type of application? I'm not sure on its toxicity. Um, it's quite a smelly wood, if I'm honest. So I'm not sure about whether that would taint food. Um as lovely as it looks, I would probably steer clear of it for this type of thing where direct oily, wet foods are going to come into contact with it. I'd probably steer clear. Nice fruit bowl, but I, I personally would steer clear of it for this project. And then David's asking, what grit um, sandpaper are you working the oil in with? So the oil would um, is 600 grit. You could go from 400 if you wanted to. If it's if This would work with 400, if I'm honest. But I've always worked in with 600. This is just a habit. But either of those would work. And Mark's asking, uh, Colwyn, have you ever turned Alst the, <laughs> the destiny today with these words? <laughs> Alstonia Kong... Genesis. I, I wouldn't know. It's um, or common name, Cheesewood. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether to take that one seriously or not. Uh, no, place. anyway, is the answer. <laughs> if um, it really, exists. Maria, Raspberry jam wood, yes, but not Cheesewood. Yeah. Um, Maria says, if you cut it into thirds, you'd have three shaped cheese boards that look like chunks of Edam. Get on. There we are. Um, with the spirit stains, so this from James... Uh, with the spirit stains, do you put spray sanding sealer on after on after the stain before the spray lacquer, uh, or is it not needed? No, what I would do, if you're going to put a spirit stain on, if you can wet sand um, the last couple of stages, just spray with a little bit of water just to raise the grain, then put your um, spirit stain on, then lacquer over the top of that, I would personally, again, um, that's what I would go with. Um... Sorry, just catching up. Um, so from Frederick, is it is it just practice to cut a flat surface? And if so, are there any tips to help? Um, it is a bit of practice. It's taking your time as well. Um, I prefer to bevel rub. Obviously, this one is a little bit trickier to bevel rub here. But just skim with a skew, a nice wide scraper or skew. That that's that's you're not cheating by doing that. Um, check with a rule or a, or a straight edge. Um, or a, a nice straight piece of timber, just constantly, just take off your high spots. It's, so it's just practice, really, um, Frederick. Just keep pursue, pursuing that flat surface, <coughs> and you get there. Um, and Wayne has a lot of fruit wood, so he has apricot, apple, peach, and pear. Um, what kind of finish could you recommend for those? Um, depending on the project. So um, I'm a fan of oil finishes because of the, um, and certainly on this sort of project, on fruit bowls and salad bowls, that sort of stuff. Um, I like the shine it gives, so it's not a glossy shine. It's sort of a sort of silky shine, really. And if you wet sand it in, um, you get a, a real a, a silky, a silky feel, sort of velvety feel to the to the piece. So I quite like that. Um, I'm not a gloss um, fan in any way, unless it's something like on pens, um, and so that that's different. But no, I'm I'm very much uh, an oil um, fan. Well, you could sanding seal and wax, but then again, if you're sanding seal and wax, make sure you do it at a decent speed, as in a high-ish speed, but make sure it's not too high for the project. Um, and 
buff with shave it burnish with shavings buff with tissue to get rid of all those polishing lines and even then buff buff with a um a polishing mop as well if there are any polished lines it, I mean, it looks like you, there's lots of trees down at the moment <laughs> oh, <no why. laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of comments here um matthew would like to has just received a ton of magnolia tree wood um again a finish for that yeah, magnolia is fantastic. The trouble with magnolia is you're going to really struggle with it drying. It does tend to open up fairly quickly because it's quite dense. Beautiful color inside. You've got that lovely creamy and then the brown in the heart. Um, but uh, again, you, I would guess most of your projects are going to be fairly small. So you've got a choice there. I would probably over oil, instead of oil, I'd probably go your sanding sealer wax root because you want a slightly higher shine on that type of project if they tend to be smaller. Um, or buff. With buffing wheels, um, triple E buff or um, uh, Carnauba wax um, be the way I go. To, uh, like I say, it does massively depend on the project. If you're making a peel of wooden fruit, you want it to be shiny. If you're making a salad or fruit bowl, they tend to be less so. Um, so yeah, just you know, um, grade it to the tim to the project that you're making. But yeah, good luck with that. Dry it. Make sure you dry it um, very uh, slowly. Otherwise, it will split on you. And Jim B's asking the same for for pear, but I think we, you said an oil. Yeah, yeah, all fruit timbers. They they they're really nice to work. They got a lovely smell about them. They're good for all of these sort of um, food food based projects. Um, they take a lovely oil as well. Um, they're just they're just nice to use. But again, a little bit harder to dry, but but still not difficult. And then Maria's asking, would holly be okay for this? Yeah, yeah, holly would be absolutely fine. Again, same thing, Maria. If you've got it dry, perfect. If you haven't, it just takes a little bit more to dry. It's very susceptible to woodworm. Um, so, yeah, just your storage, you do drying time. Drying um, is, is very much um, one to be careful of. Um, and also just bear in mind, it does move quite a lot as well, just because of its density. Um, so if you're rough turning, expect a few more losses um and uh yeah just just drying them very slowly um mr nick would like and um some tips for turning wenge um just picked up some for pen work and making sure there's nothing untoward waiting for him no i mean if it's pen stuff perfect no problem at all if you're turning bowls from it they can be quite quite troublesome you need to sharpen regularly because it's very a very abrasive timber it's quite a peppery timber as well and so an irritant um and also the end grain um, can be troublesome so nice sharp re uh, resharpen before you do your final cuts that just to help you with your sanding really um, but beautiful timber once it's all finished i mean stunning chocolate brown those lovely flex running through it so yeah nice timber watch the splinters as well the splinters can can make your they can go septic quite quickly so just be careful of the splinters on it as well watching sharp edges you, you'll pick up splinter quite quick so um, but no lovely timber just uh, one of those difficult ones to turn you know right dust extraction on we're going to sh uh, sand that up get some oil on it get him finished for you same thing i'm going to do not as much sanding as i would normally Stop and have a quick look. We've got the same area that's tearing up on the inside as we had on the outside. So like the outside, I will re-sand this when you guys have gone. But we're going to get a little bit more done. And then oil.
So I'm going to move on to the 150. have another quick stop and look good there we go to the 240 Here we are, one uh, four hundred. Beautiful, right? Let's get some of that oil on. Yeah, fire your questions, Ben. Sorry, I was <coughs> getting um, absorbed then. <laughs> um, so, um, where are we? Um, ah, so, question here from Jim B. Um, when you um, refinish the outside of that, Colin, how are you going to fix it to the lathe? Well, I'll, we're, we're going to keep the recess on this one. So, I'll just keep the recess there. Um, if you wanted it, to sand within the recess then you can use button jaws or plate jaws to hold the rim um, once you've done that side and then back to the recess i'll show you in a minute when we take it off be careful when you wet sand lay speed all the way to zero and start the lathe where it's where it first starts so it's slower speed otherwise you will get covered in oil as it flies off this is just slow enough for that oil to stay in place and all we're doing the, the nap of the, the grain now so those little fibers are just rising up we're then sanding them in at the same time of, as we're doing that the, the dust that we're creating is is mixing with the oil and creates a slurry that fills the grain so you get a real that's why you get the silkiness afterwards and the other thing with that as in traditional wet sanding, you won't get those fibers stick up again, so it'll stay smooth for a long, long time. There we go. It's just starting to dry and drag now, so when it starts to do that, you can up the lay speed a little, and then when it starts to dry and drag again, we're going to burnish hard with shavings. That creates heat, and that helps that drying process start. Remember, this is a food safe oil. It has no drying agent in, so it's natural evaporation that we're hoping for and the actual drying of the oil itself. So that's that. A handful of shavings. Always use the shavings that uh, you've just cut. Um, if you don't, if you use another timber shavings, the likelihood is you get colour coming out of those shavings onto your project. Terry's asking if you could use willow Colwyn. I don't see why not. The, uh, the only slight issue I can see is it might be a little bit soft, I suppose. Um, but that would be the only reason. There we are. Get a fresh bit of tissue.
That's a single coat of finishing oil. I would now wait for that to dry overnight. If I wasn't going to resand it again, wait for it to dry overnight and then give it probably another another two coats. Really, I don't want this shiny. Like I say, and, you know, oil is fantastic, but it will build up color, will build up shine through reapplying. So just be aware of that. But that's a pretty bit of timber, isn't it? Let's take it off the lathe. I'll show you, Jim, the um, the grip we've got there. So I'm using the seed jaws to expanding to expand oh, to expand it into a recess. So there's there's the recess that that's expanding into. Okay, so it can easily be remounted there. But what a wonderful timber that is! That's a piece of um, of elm, really nice old elm. It's got a little bit of the lovely green streaking running through it as well. Lots of features, lots of things to to make it look nice. Yes, Ben. Um, so uh, a question here from uh, from Ross. Um, he has a piece of Himalayan cedar, um, and he wants to keep the smell. Um, what can he put put on it to keep the smell intact? Yeah, oil's pretty good. Oil will let the, the timber breathe um, so that, that smell come out. Don't lacquer it. Um, I, if you're going to use a uh, spirit, um, if you're going to use a sanding cedar, I'd go for spirit over cellulose um but yeah apart from that don't put any lacquers on it don't varnish or anything like that because that just seal things in so yeah i'd probably oil if i'm honest and then adrian's asking um could you fill in the cracks to stop food getting stuck inside yeah absolutely now, you've got several options when it comes to filling in cracks in timber you can either go, go for epoxy glue and things like the Z-poxies, the Araldites, all those things make a really good uh, cement. You could go for resin, and within that resin, you can add other things. So you can add pigments to disguise it, make it look like part of the knot. You could go for color, so you can highlight stuff. You can put um, um, uh, uh, metal uh, glitters or metal um, mica powders in, that sort of stuff, if you wanted to highlight them. Personally, on this sort of thing, I would probably put a dark one in just to color it so it looked as though it's part this for instance looks as though it's part of the timber so a nice dark resin in here and dark resin in there i think that would really suit that bowl uh well i'm like a dark brown or even a black something like that you know but yeah what lovely timber that is and paul's asking um how fast is the lathe running when sanding the oil and buffing so i was running that around about 200 mark um so 200 revs Maria says, uh, nice bit of wood. Shame it's going to get covered in Stilton. <laughs> <laughs> um, where are we here? Um, the, the lots of thanks coming in for you, Colwyn. Great demo. Um, um, is today record number of views? I, I don't think so, Jim. Back back in the day, we used to get um, some really good numbers. Um, but great. Thanks for your support today. Um, after leaving 24 hours before second and third coat, would you wet sand after each coat? No, no. What I would do now, you, so before we put the next one on, so you've put this one on, just give it a slight denib with a very fine abrasive, just a very light sanding, and then very light coats of oil then after. Because your, your initial one would have soaked all the way in, done, done its job, and now you're just backing that up. So very, very light. Almost, we used to say, is let the let the timber sniff the can. That's about it. But it's a very, very light coat. Don't leave anything on the surface pool. So wipe the surface clean afterwards. And again, another 24 hours, and then your third coat. Um, a great suggestion from Terry, maybe coffee ground in there. Uh, yeah. Um, give that nice yeah, dark yeah, color you absolutely. were talking about. And then Donna's asking, how thick, not including the rim? Um let's have a look let's have a look what can i how can i measure that let's go with a double-sided caliper get that closed up not including the rim i am it looks to be around about 25 mil yep we're almost bang on an inch there so around about 25 mil donna all good Wow, fantastic. Thank you ever so much, everybody, again, for joining us. This, um, I really enjoyed this project. And I think uh, I, I can I analyze sometimes why I like more some projects over the other. And it's down to the timber. The timber really, really helps. If this was an awful timber to turn, I wouldn't have enjoyed it half as much. Um, so 
the next couple of weeks are interesting. I think it's a square bowl next week. And then I think the weekend after is penguins for me anyway. So uh, uh, thanks, Maria, for that one. I'm practicing already. Uh, Maria has supplied uh, plenty of penguin pitches um, that would we'll be studying very hard. So we're going to have a uh, um, uh, compare notes on that one, I think. But for me, um, that was uh, the cheese board. Tomorrow, Jason's on um, Japanese saws, I believe, isn't it? And then, Ben, you are on Thursday doing... Um, so we've got some fold-away coat hooks on the scroll saw. There we are. So a full week of it. Thanks for joining uh, joining us again um, and, and looking at woodworking wisdom. Um, and don't forget, I say it every single week, if you like what you see, uh, thumbs up. Um, if you don't, thumbs down. Um, a share with as many people as you can and uh, think might enjoy it. But uh, uh, until next time, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>